our facial aging webinar with Dr. Kelvin Young. Uh, my name is Krista Parr. I work on the admin staff here at Dermatology Associates of Rochester, and I'll be acting as kind of the host for tonight. Um, also on with us, we have Jennifer Parada, who's our patient care coordinator. Dr. Young will introduce her a little bit more in depth in the presentation. She's gonna be monitoring the chat for us this evening. So we do ask that if you have questions that you'd like to ask Dr. Young, he is going to take questions at the end of his presentation. So as we're going along, if you think of something that you'd like to ask, please click on the little chat um, icon that's at the bottom of your screen, type your question in there and Jennifer will get to it at the end of the presentation. Um, one last housekeeping item, a couple actually, we are going to be recording this webinar. So it's being recorded as we speak. Everyone is going to receive a follow-up email at the conclusion of the presentation and it will include a recording of the webinar. So you can't stay to the end for any reason, or you know you want to hear all of the questions or whatever it might be. Um, that that recording will be in your follow up email, along with lots of useful links, contact information for how you could set up an in person consultation with Dr. Young if that's something that you're interested in doing, and um, a few other things that we just think that you'll find useful and informative um, as we go along. So without further ado, I will go ahead and turn it over to Dr. Kelvin Young uh, to get us started. Dr. Young. All right. Thanks, Krista. Everybody hear me okay? Thumbs up. Great. So let me share my screen here and get into present mode. All right. Thumbs up if that looks okay. All right, great. So thanks everyone for coming. I'm Dr. Calvin Young, and I'm really excited to talk to you tonight about uh, facial aging surgery, some of the basics, how I think about it, and what you can expect kind of all the way from starting to think about it through a successful, you know, post-operative period. So let's get started. Uh, tonight's agenda, we'll learn a little bit about me. Uh, we'll learn a lot about what makes a youthful face and understand how we move from a youthful face to the more mature face. We'll talk a little bit about some technique issues and uh, hopefully that will kind of put some of your minds at ease about the changes that have been going on in face and neck lift surgery over the last you know, uh, 20, 25 years or so. We'll try to dispel some myths with some facts and truths about what's really going on uh, as part of your, uh, you know, facial aging and, and facelift and neck lift surgery. Uh, and then we'll make sure that we're gonna have some time for questions at the end. So please uh, reach out through the chat and Jen's gonna be uh, monitoring that for us tonight. So a little bit about me. Uh, I am originally from upstate New York. Uh, I grew up down in uh, the Southern tier and then went to the University of Maryland for undergrad. I came back to Buffalo for my medical school training. And then after your years in medical school, you decide what kind of doctor you want to be. And so I first thought I wanted to be a general surgeon. So I spent uh, my full uh, general surgery training at Yale New Haven Hospital in New Haven, Connecticut. And then kind of halfway through my general surgery training, I found out that uh, plastic surgery is amazing. And that's what I wanted to do with my life. So I continued my training Oh, out at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, Michigan. I am a proud husband and father. That's my family over there on the right-hand side. And I got two little girls and my wife, uh, who's also a physician. I love combining non-surgical techniques as well as uh, techniques in the operating room, in the laser suite. And uh, I think that that gives us kind of the most natural result in that one plus one equals three kind of um, 
adjuvant effect, if you will. I have performed literally thousands of surgical procedures, and uh, I plan on a long career here at uh, Dermatology Associates of Rochester. A little bit about my team, Jen, who is on the call tonight. Uh, Jen has been with the Dermatology Associates since 2017. She is the patient care coordinator for the cosmetic center and also for uh, the, my plastic surgery patients. She focuses on the head and neck cases with me and she's really easy to talk to. She's energetic, she's compassionate and you're gonna love meeting her. Uh, Ashley Cook is next. She is a licensed practical nurse. She had some experience in uh, plastic surgery uh, for about 14 years before she joined Dermatology Associates in 2017 as well. She is our cosmetic nurse, a laser specialist, and she helps me with my uh, breast and body consultations. Catherine Lawrence um, joined the team in 2020. She is my surgical scheduler. She'll be one of the first people who greets you in the plastic surgery center. She'll uh, help you walk through the process of getting your date scheduled, getting your follow-up scheduled, and she's uh, a great communicator. And finally, we have Britta. Britta is our newest team member who joined in 2021. That said, she has 14 years of uh, surgical experience in uh, plastics and she helps me, you know, my right hand in the operating room and also helps me with the uh, post-operative care of our patients. Uh, next, we're going to review a little bit of anatomy, kind of broad strokes and how each of these tissues uh, ages in the face over time. So as you can see in the diagram, the major components of the facial and neck anatomy are the skin, the connective tissue like the ligaments and the fascia or the tough connective tissue over the muscle layers. And then there's uh, very specific pockets of fat in the face, uh, both on the superficial layer and the deep layers. And then there's the bony skeleton or the foundation of the facial structure. So what happens to all of these structures as we age? I love this photo because I don't know if anybody has seen this photo before, but this gentleman spent his entire career as a truck driver. And so you can see how asymmetric the aging is on his face due to the effects of sun damage on the skin. So as we age, the skin gets damaged from the UV rays. You get thinning of skin. It loses its ability to be as elastic or springy as it used to be. Um, it sags and it gets brown spots and wrinkles in it. The connective tissue layers, the fascia, the ligaments, those um, loosen. They uh, can't support the tissue as well as they used to. And so that allows for descent that you see in various characteristic spots on the face. For the fat layers, as we age, those deflate, they atrophy, and they, with the loosening of the connective tissue, sag. And so that's um, a very uh, you know, characteristic process that happens across all um, you know, men, women, and all uh, age groups. And then the bone, uh, bone actually resorbs over time. So we lose bony um, mass in the, uh, jaw, in the jaw line, uh, in the cheekbones, in the temples, and all of that volume loss from the bone, the fat, and the skin contributes to what we see as a, a mature face. So this kind of demonstrates how this woman schematically has aged over time. In the youthful face on the left, we have that upside down triangle where most of the volume in her face is up in the upper two thirds in the temp, her temples are full, her cheeks are full. She's got a very defined jawline and she has not had 
enough time to have these sun damage effects and the loss of fat and volume and um, the sagging from the, the ligaments. As she ages, she will start to have this triangle sort of flip upside down and she gets more of the volume of her face appears to be lower, the, the lower third of the face at the jawline appears to be heavier. She's lost volume in her temples, volume under her eyes, and the folds around her mouth um, because of those specific ligaments aren't holding up that tissue back and away from the mouth anymore. As I said, this occurs in all age groups. So we have uh, Clint Eastwood here, 93 years old, I believe. And you can still see in his younger photo, still more of the volume was up high in his face. He had full cheeks. He had a uh, rugged but def and defined jawline and his uh, cheeks were full. And then as he's aged, He's lost a lot of volume, he's got sun damage, he's got wrinkles, and the you know, connective tissue layer is starting to sag. This occurs in all skin types, and the same thing is happening in each of these photos. Each of these women has lost volume, they've uh, had some sagging, and the volume has drifted down into the lower parts of their face. skipped ahead. Um, here's another schematic. So at the skin level, we see um, the aging process moving from left to right. We have wrinkling going on, we have volume loss, and we have sagging. At the next level, the fat compartments, I think you can appreciate the volume of fat in each schematic sort of uh, diminishes and falls down further onto the face, and then even the bony layer. Most noticeable at the cheekbone, the orbit actually gets larger, the jaw angle recedes, and the base of the nose actually recedes as well. So what is a youthful face? To reiterate, a youthful face is full, it has very defined structures with smooth transitions between those structures. It has a lack of sun damage uh, in the form of lack of wrinkles and lack of brown spots. And then there's a very sharp and well-defined transition from the jawline to the neck. I think that this photo really shows how important it is to think of the jaw and the neck as kind of one unit of how you perceive the face. So in the youthful lady on the left, you've got this perfect uh, right angle from the profile view with the jaw and the neckline kind of coming uh, at right angles. Whereas the uh, more mature woman on the right the skin has started to sag, the muscle layer underneath has started to sag, and that angle has kind of uh, opened up a little bit. So let's spend a little time on some celebrity photos because well, it's fun and we're trying to have a little bit of fun. So uh, Cindy Crawford, I have no idea if she's had anything done because I'm not her surgeon but she sure hasn't aged a bit. And so how has she kind of done that? The most likely thing that we're looking for is, has she maintained volume in the upper thirds of her face, in her cheeks? Has she, uh, she doesn't have any wrinkles, she's got very little sun damage and her jawline is nicely defined and you can accomplish all of that with facial aging surgery and some of our non-invasive options, which we'll go over as well. Here's uh, Sandra Bullock. She is 56 in the photo on the right. And it just, you know, her the volume is still there in her cheeks, in her temples, in her lips, her neck uh, and jawline are very sharp. 
And that's what we're looking for in, in a youthful face in a woman. Here we have Jennifer Aniston, age 52. Doesn't look like she's aged a day. And again, what I wanna really stress with everybody is that their people are maintaining volume in their face and they're maintaining uh, a sharp jawline with no sagging of skin or jowling, uh, jowling at the nasolabial fold or uh, at, the, at the jawline. Here's an, uh, a 74-year-old Susan Sarandon. Um, pretty sure she's had a neck lift based on the change in her neck. Um, and it's the, the, the lack of wrinkles, the maintenance of that sharp jawline and the maintenance of those big cheekbones. So one thing that I get uh, a lot of people asking me about is they, they, you know, growing up, they saw not great facelifts in like the nineties and they, they feel like everybody looks uh, like this person, too tight, overdone, and I want to spend a little bit of time on technique and tell you why and how far we've come from these kind of facelifts in the last, you know, 15 years or so. So the first facelifts were done uh, a while ago, and those were done basically by just undermining the skin and pulling it tight. And we know that the skin is an elastic structure. And so we expect that to stretch back out over time. And the, the old technique, the skin only facelift did not address all those important structures underneath. And because of that, it was more likely to kind of result in this kind of windswept or overdone appearance where the surgeons had to just kind of pull the skin as tight as they could to get the reduction of the wrinkles and then that would uh, look too tight and that has not been done for a very long time. More recently with uh, time spent in the anatomy labs and, uh, and the CT scanners we now know that there's this uh, connective tissue layer called the SMAS underneath the skin and fat that is very robust. It's very tough. And so now, in addition to addressing the excess skin that we pull back, we do something with this mass. There are a bunch of techniques. We can talk all about it, but we'll suffice it to say that we put all the tension on the SMAS layer and then kind of gently lay the skin back over top so that you get a nice long lasting and natural result. And then that kind of addresses the, the loosening. And then we um, have found that with uh, fat grafting to add volume back, because I think that we've stressed that we've, we're losing volume in addition to losing elasticity. And so we put some fat back in in some very specific ways. So we're gonna dispel some myths now. Uh, a face, one myth that might be out there is that a facelift or neck lift is a permanent thing. Um, that is not true. The thing that you'll hear during your consultation, and I'm sure the consultants have heard it enough that they could repeat it, but uh, the facelift, the neck lift, any aging surgery uh, turns back the hands of time, but it will not stop the clock. And so you will continue to age gracefully and you may even require other procedures to maintain your result over time. For example, Meryl Streep, age 72, uh, thinks that you have to embrace getting older and she has aged very gracefully, but she still looks fantastic. And so she um, has kind of embraced that idea as well. Um, I can't have more than one facelift, so it's better to wait until I really need it. Um, it's, that's also false. Um, it is not uncommon for people to have secondary procedures 
Some are small things in the office, lasers, injectables. Others are revisional procedures in the operating room. And those things combined um, can give you a much, an even longer lasting result like Raquel Welch, who is 80 years old in this photo. She looks fantastic. Uh, one patient said that they thought that they couldn't get any Botox or fillers anymore once they got their fate lift, so they were going to wait. Um, the surgical intervention, facelift, neck lift does not prevent any subsequent treatments. In fact, uh, as I've tried to stress, that's actually complemented really well, and you can maintain your result even longer if you continue to do these smaller things like fillers or fat grafting, uh, continue with your Botox or come in and do some laser resurfacing either at the time of your face uh, and neck lift surgery or you know years down the road. So in terms of next steps, um, congratulations, you've already taken the first step by attending our webinar tonight. As Krista said, there is going to be an email that goes out, and we'd be happy to see you. Uh, complimentary, no, no, you know, risk-free consultation. You can meet with me and Jen. Um, I'm at every consult. I see patients at every post-op visit. And what I want to stress about that is that I spend time with patients really listening to their goals. I really want to hear what they feel ages their face, what their concerns are, and what their goals are so that I can really kind of tailor my approach specifically to address those concerns and kind of guide them through this process because, you know, it's the first consultation is exciting. It's also a lot of information. And so um, you'll get follow up phone calls from Jen making sure that, you know, if you need to have another conversation with me that, you know, or, or making sure that we're on the same page. Another cool thing that we do in the consultation that I think really adds some value to patients and even alleviates some fears for some patients is something called the Vectra uh, photography system. Uh, Vectra is a uh, 3D rendering from a uh, company called Canfield. And I have some uh, examples of that here in a moment. But what this does is it allows us to take a 3D rendering of your face and neck. And then I input it into some software. And that allows me to take your face and neck and use the tools in the software to kind of recreate what I think it, what I think looks nice and what I think is possible for your face and neck lift surgery. That way you're getting not a before and after of somebody else to compare and see if that's what you think you're going for. It's really you know, your face and what I think I can do in the operating room to address your concerns so that we're on the same page. And I've had a bunch of patients um, communicate that during that review of that vector photography, they felt much better about the notion that they weren't going to be overdone or windswept. It's really still their face. It's just their face from 10, 15 years ago. So let's go over some of those photos. So this is the before I did anything of our uh, lovely patient. And we're gonna kind of bounce back and forth. So this is the after of me spending some time putting some volume in her temples, in her cheeks, resurfacing the neck and the jawline. And so we'll bounce back and forth a few times. So we've corrected that jowling around the uh, angle of the jaw. We've added some volume in specific areas. We've gotten rid of some hollowing in other areas. And disregard this kind of shadowing, that's just an artifact of the uh, system itself. We can look at another view in the kind of 45 degree. 
bouncing back and forth, we see that addition of volume. We see the pulling back of the tissues and re-supporting them uh, with some fat grafting and a very nice sharp neckline. Here's our side profile. This one is the most dramatic for most people. So we've got the before and the after. And we've kind of went from that uh, open angle to that very 90 degree angle at the neckline. And I think that this is a very um, natural, very achievable result with a facelift and neck lift with fat grafting. So we're gonna head out to the question section here. These are the questions that I get the most. So we'll just address those right now. Um, it is surgery. Most people uh, don't describe uh, pain, but more of a tenderness and some swelling and bruising. Most people, if they take a day of um, a stronger pain medication, like a narcotic pain medication, that's all they really need. Um, Tylenol is going to be your mainstay, and then keeping your head elevated um, and your compression garment on. Um, in terms of downtime, generally, we tell people to expect about two weeks of social downtime where they're going to be swollen and bruised and they're going to be wearing their compression garment faithfully so that we can get that swelling down as fast as possible. And so you'll probably not want to be out to dinner or doing the grocery shopping, but kind of laying low at home and having your family members help you out. Um, but after that, once the swelling and bruising goes down, you're going to be excited to get back out there. Uh, generally speaking, there are four components to a face and neck lift scar. There's some portion that goes up into the hairline. There's the, uh, for women, the, the ear crease around this bump called the tragus. And then it comes around the ear lobule and takes a sharp turn in this, uh, you know, a little sulcus behind your ear. And then there's the occipital portion where you take a right angle and move it back into the hairline. So because your eye expects there to be a transition there, it's actually, it heals beautifully. You're not, it's not on under any tension and it really hides very well, especially at conversational distance. You know, your hairdresser might know that you had a surgery done but, um, you know, people walking down the street and, you know, even close family members and friends are going to say, you know, you look very rested, you know, have you lost weight? Um, but they're not going to be like looking at the side of your face and wondering what that is. Okay, so if you have decided that a surgical intervention is right for you after your consultation with uh, Jen or myself or the rest of the team. Then you're going to work with Catherine to find the optimal date and time for you to come to the operating room. I'll see you again for your preoperative appointment where we'll go over the consent, the any questions that you're going to have that have come up or family members questions. And we're going to go over your preoperative instructions, your postoperative care, we're going to get all your medications ordered ahead of time so that you have them in hand and you're not going to, you know, leave and have to um, go grab all that stuff on your way home from the operating room. And then finally, I want you to know that you'll have my uh, personal cell phone number. I'll call your family member after the procedure. I'll call you the evening after your procedure. And I encourage you, I want to hear from you. I want you to text me pictures, call me any time of day with any concerns. The, the, the thing I don't want is you to be at home worrying when you know I gave you my cell phone and I, and I, wanna, I wanna make sure that you're comfortable. Uh, you'll go home the same day and we'll check on you that night. I'll see you in the office the day after that and we'll make sure that you're doing great. 
And then we'll follow you up again at one week for some key suture removals. Um, but most of everything else is uh, all dissolvable. Finally, um, I want to share that I want to hear from you. I want to make your concerns my concerns. And so when people come in wanting to appear more youthful, I can guide you through that process. I want to listen to your concerns and make sure that the plan is, is tailored specifically to you. All right, I think that is it. So I'm gonna unshare and turn it back over to the team. All right, I know Jen has got some questions that have been asked in the chat. I've seen a couple of those come through. We've got some really great questions. So Jen, if you want to just take it away with some questions for Dr. Young. All right, wonderful. So Dr. Young, we do have some questions that came in. The first one we have um, is asking, does the outcome of the procedure depend on the thickness of the skin? Um, I would say no. I think that, um, you know, as the skin ages over time, the, the older patient will have the, uh, the, the thinner skin. But once you pull that connective tissue and that skin back and re-volumize with some fat grafting uh, and, you know, uh, continue to tailor that with lasers or whatever down the road, maybe, um, the, the thickness of the skin does not impact the, the overall outcome that we could deliver. Okay. Very good. Next question. Um, what about weight gain or weight loss prior and post procedure? Sure. So usually we focus on weight gain or weight loss when we're talking about body procedures. Um, what I will say is that generally speaking, you should be pretty close to the weight that you want to be and are stable at when you're thinking of doing any anti-aging surgery. So if you, you know, uh, were to lose a lot of weight, and we're not talking like five, 10 pounds, we're talking 20, 30 pounds or more. That could change your outcome in terms of, you know, now I could have taken more skin uh, out, but um, we can go over all of those concerns and um, really, you know, check in with your weight loss goals and make sure that, you know, we're available to you throughout the process. Very good. We have another question here. Where, where does the fat come from for the fat grafting? Oh, sure. Um, anywhere we can steal some. It's not enough to consider like it liposuction, although it is. It wouldn't change the contour of the area that we took it from. It's really, you know, maybe 10 to 15 cc's of fat or milliliters. And so we'll often take that from kind of the, the flank or right underneath the belly button but, or kind of the outer thigh. And then we process that down while you're sleeping and, and re-inject it. Okay, very good. Are the eyes included in the surgery? Uh, they are not. Generally speaking, for the stuff that I kind of focused on today, you are talking about the really addressing the lower third of the face, volumizing the cheeks, the temples, and resuspending the muscles of the neck and face. Um, it can be combined with upper and lower and or lower eyelid surgery, but not every patient needs that. And so that's why I think it's important to really listen to the patient's concern and tailor each procedure so that it's not a one size fits all kind of approach. Okay, very good. Where does the surgery take place? 
I operate out of uh, the Westfall Surgery Center, which is in the Clinton Crossings area, uh, a couple miles from the office, as well as uh, Highland Hospital. Generally, most of the procedures are done at Westfall because it is outpatient surgery. And uh, if absolutely necessary, we would go to the, the Highland Hospital, um, but generally speaking, we're right out of Westfall. Okay, great. Uh, may I share the post webinar video with family and friends? Yeah, sure. That Wonderful. sounds great. We would love for you to. Sure. All right, very good. Is the possibility of keloiding something to be concerned about? Yes. It is something that we would certainly talk about during your consultation. So if you, so a keloid is an abnormal scarring process for people who haven't heard of that before. And it tends to run in families or have some sort of genetic component. And if you have had a keloid before, it makes you a little more likely to have a keloid in another area. Now that said, um, there's always something going on around keloids. And if you really spend some time with patients kind of learning about what the healing process was like, you can usually identify something that probably contributed to it. And there are ways to address that early in the process with steroid injections so that it doesn't get to the point where you have that thickened lumpy scar. Okay, all right. This is a good question. Um, I have a, uh, an attendee asking if there will be lasers to remove brown spots from the face during surgery. That is something that we can do. We, we have that uh, capability. It's not we have such great lasers in our office that it would be something that I would either do leading up to the surgery or after the surgery instead of during the procedure itself. And those are um, really well tolerated. Some of our lasers don't require numbing at all. Uh, others just require some topical numbing and they're really uh, impressive at getting rid of brown spots. Okay. Um, quite a popular question coming up next. A few people have asked about the approximate cost of the surgical mm -hmm. procedure, cost range. Can you yeah, give sure. information on that? Absolutely. So whenever you get a surgical quote, there are three parts to it. There's the professional fee, which goes to the office or the surgeon that did the procedure. There is the facility charge and the anesthetic charge. And so when you get a quote from us, they'll have all of those components spelled out for you. So the facility charge and the anesthetic charge are based on time that we spend in the operating room over at Westfall. And that goes directly to them. And then there's the professional fee. So generally speaking for a face lift, neck lift, or some combination of all of the above. The costs are in the kind of 10 to $20,000 range. Obviously the less things that you do, the less time you're in operating room, um, the lower the cost and it can go up from there. Okay, very good. And if I may add to that, uh, we also offer uh, low interest financing as well, which is a great option. Many patients do take advantage of that. So um, that is something that I uh, discuss with um, patients during your consultation as well. So uh, let's see here, what to segue out of that, what is the average length of the surgery? Uh, every patient's different. Mm -hmm. um, generally speaking, it can last anywhere from three to six hours, depending on how much we're doing. Okay, very good. And it looks like I have one more question for you here. Um, if I have a wedding coming up in three months, is that gonna be enough time for me to heal? 
Um, that it would be enough time. Um, it would be important to get you into the office pretty quickly so that we could move you through that process um, of you know, meeting us and, and finding a date that works that's coming up and, um, you know, getting all the, making sure that you're healthy and, you know, ready to go for the operating room from a safety standpoint, but um, it's, it's possible. All right, Chris, a couple more uh, have popped up. Do we have time for a couple more questions? Yeah, I think we can yeah. do a couple more. Okay, all right, great. Um, if I haven't been to your office in a number of years, do you still have my records on file? Uh, yeah, uh, we have the paper charts from before we went uh, electronic and then you know everything in the electronic record is still there. Okay. Wonderful. Uh, can I have facial surgery if I've had a malignant melanoma on my face? Uh, it depends on where it is and what facial surgery you're interested in. But, um, you know, we would take a look at the scarring and, and, and take a look at your history and make sure that you're safe and talk about your concern. And if I have any you know, question or concern, we'll, we'll address it at that time. Okay, great. Uh, if I've had a facelift uh, in the past, would you be able to do the revision? Sure. Yeah, it would be great to know what your other surgeon um, did with, you know, operative records and that sort of thing. But it's, it's certainly safe to have someone besides your initial operating surgeon do a revision. Okay, wonderful. I have a couple attendees asking, how do I go ahead and schedule my consultation? Great. Um, I think Krista is gonna send that email out with all of those instructions at the end. Um, and then we can make sure that, um, you know, we can get all those consults scheduled and I'll kind of defer to Krista on that one. Yeah, I mean, if you'd like to jot down the phone number right now, it is 585-272-0700. And the direct extension to dial is 117. So 272-0700, extension 117. And that will connect you directly to Devin, who does the scheduling for our cosmetic uh, and plastic surgery consultations. Um, and she would love to get you scheduled for um, a complimentary consultation since you attended this webinar tonight. And again, that information will be in the email. Jen, do we have any more questions? We, we do. They're coming in fast and furious. I don't know how much time um, we have. Um, these ones are outside of uh, questions regarding facelift, but more or less non-invasives. Just some questions about some of the offerings. Um, so do we do Kybella? Oh yeah, our office does offer Kybella for sure. All right, very good. Um, and can you get a scar where the fat is taken from when you do the fat grafting? Yes. Anytime you make a cut into the skin that's full thickness, there will be a scar. Generally, um, it's done like within the line of the belly button, so it, you can't see it. Uh, if it's anywhere else, you kind of do it in like the, you know, the belt line area or these, these incisions are a couple millimeters long and they heal up beautifully. It, it's really imperceptible once it's, you know, six months down the road. Okay, very good, very good. Wonderful. Um, I think, let's see. Do you do a bullhorn lip lift? Uh, it's possible for the right patient. Uh, I'd be happy to take a look at your consult and we can, we can chat about that. Okay, very good, very good. 
And how far out are we scheduling for appointments? Um, I'm not sure if uh, you're referring to consultations or surgeries, but if you can let us know how far we're scheduling for both, that'd be great. Oh, um, I think we're, well, we're, we're gonna work, work with you to get whatever we can do accomplished, but I think generally we're about a month out uh, mm -hmm. for consultations. And, um, you know, so at least a month to get you from your consultation to the operating room. All right. All right. All right. Awesome. Well, thank you everyone for those fantastic questions. It's always amazing to have, you know, a good dialogue going. Um, so with that, we are going to wrap it up. Uh, thank you, Dr. Young, for that excellent presentation. I hope that everyone found it educational and insightful and gave you a nice peek into the process and um, Dr. Young's technique and all of that good stuff. And as we've mentioned a few times now, there will be a follow-up email. You can look for that tomorrow morning. And um, Devin will be in the office ready to answer um, any consultation uh, requests that you have. She would love to get you scheduled. And again, that information will be in there along with financing information, um, a link to Dr. Young's bio, some more in-depth information about the practice. Um, so lots of good stuff in there and we encourage you to look for that in the morning. And with that, we will go ahead and sign off. So thank you so much everyone for attending. We hope to see you soon. All right, thanks everybody. Thank you.